you're, you're like, if you're like me, you're probably asking, when on earth will we ever move on from this? Uh, I would have to quit reading this portion to be able to move on because every time I read it and reread it, I get a fresh perspective on what the Apostle Paul is telling us in this portion. I'm reading Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 again. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace that is given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God is allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Father, guide us by the Spirit this morning as we consider the thoughts that you've laid on my heart. Father, just take these simple words and empower them by the Spirit so that your word will minister to us where we are at as your people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin the message this morning with an article that comes from the Eganville Leader, which is an independent news source out of Eganville, Ontario. Before I do this, however, I want to make an introductory comment because I want you to know where I'm coming from in this issue. Uh, this letter deals with a sensitive issue that we are facing in our culture today with regards to identity. And you have heard the expression used many times now, and it's becoming more and more common, that we need to allow people the right to self-identify. And I realize that there is a valid point in that issue, uh, but I also realize that it is a very dangerous thought that we are dealing with in our culture. I say what I have to say this morning because I'm going to be talking about identity as God's people. I say it uh, not because I want to be critical, but I'm going to read this because I want us to be critical in our, in our analysis. I want us to have a clear perspective or a clearer perspective of one of the major shifts in our culture today. In fact, as a man who is in his 70s, approaching his 80s, uh, it is a major concern for me personally because I am seeing something which is happening in our culture which is redefining who we are in our basic humanity. And I believe that the end result and the consequences of this are going to be absolutely devastating for those who are going along this path. The article I'm referring to is titled Students in Local Schools Identify as Animals but no litter boxes exist. There are students in schools, and I'm just reading the article. This is from the Eganville Leader, October 18th, uh, 2022. There are students in schools across Renfrew County who identify as animals, although there are no litter boxes in schools. That is not a secret, David Kaiser, Vice Chair of the Renfrew County District School Board, said on Monday. It is known throughout the board that we do have students who identify as animals. There has been a great deal of interest and backlash on, backlash on both sides of the issue in the last several weeks since a letter was published in the Leader expressing concern about seven children in the Renfrew public school system identifying as animals. Details are hard to find, but it has been confirmed 
that one student identifies as a frog in one public school and another public school has a litter box in the washroom for a student who identifies as a cat. The letter writer, Ray Stanley of Barry's Bay Road. In response, the school board chair issued a joint release last week with the Renfrew County Catholic School District Board denying there were litter boxes in the school. So I'm going to stop right there. They were denying that the litter boxes are in the schools, but they're not being denying the truth of what is happening. The situation is real. Please know that the Renfrew County School Board and the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board do not have and have never had litter boxes in any of our elementary or secondary schools. Further, in the provincially mandated collection of demographic data, questions of identity are specific to gender, the release stated. We do not collect any data regarding animal identity and we do not recognize such identities. Stop again. Even to make that statement is stunning to me that we are actually saying these things and talking about these things. The Renfrew County District School Board and the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board recognizes, values, accepts and nurtures all students and staff regardless of their gender identity or expression, the release concluded. Following the statement from the school boards, the original letter writer again reached out and again confirming there are students who identify as animals in area schools. Mr. Kaiser confirmed this as well to the leader, although he did not vote, you know, although he did note he felt the issue was being sensationalized, and he's probably right in that. He did confirm that there is a request for kitty litter in one school, and it was denied by the board. This is a controversial issue, he noted. Our board is being transparent, but the privacy of these students is very important. He said he did agree, or he did disagree with some of the comments which have been attributed to him about the issue of students identifying as animals. And he, this is a quote, I have never implied that there is more to this issue, he said. Only that I was informed that there were seven students in the county who have self-identified as animals. While the board is being transparent about this issue, he said to protect the privacy of these students, no further information is being divulged. And that's good. Mr. Kaiser is requesting a report on this situation so the board has some facts as well as to know what procedures the board had in place to deal with the situation. We need our equity and, and inclusivity officer to report to the board, he said. There is a difference of opinion on how this should be handled, he admitted. The kitty litter was a rumor, he stressed. And Mr. Kaiser said while he has heard from two individuals and the media on this issue, he has not spoken to any concerned parents. And this is a quote. My last point, and I have shared this with my board colleagues, is that I do believe that these students need some type of support from the board. However, before we can get to this point, we need to better understand why this is occurring and how the board is currently dealing with the students. Board members are open to the public, uh, board meetings are open to the public, and he said that he hoped the equity and inclusivity officer would report to the board this fall, although he did not know the date when this would happen. That letter was reported on in LifeSite News, which is another independent news agency that I refer to sometimes, not always, but sometimes, because I can get links that give me information I think is important. It's LifeSite News, it's basically a Catholic uh, a Catholic oriented news source and this is what they say with regards to this situation. The Vice Chair of the Renfrew County District School Board in Ontario has told LifeSite News that the rumor of children identifying as animals in some of the school districts and uh, some of the district schools is true. 
He says, I have first-hand knowledge that we do have students identifying as animals, and one in particular that I can confirm 100%. The Vice Chair David Kaiser confirmed in a phone call interview with LifeSite News on Thursday of this last week. And then he says this, and this is interesting. While saying that the Kaiser fam while saying that Kaiser fully supports freedom of expression, he does believe that a child choosing to identify as an animal far exceeds this freedom. And it is his opinion that the school board should ensure that there is a support system in place to help these confused children. And he says this, I don't think it's normal, Kaiser told LifeSite News. I don't think that a child is thinking normally or naturally if they are standing up in front of their students in the class and identifying as an animal. I feel that is something that needs support. And I would agree with him 100%. But then he says this also in his interview. Again, it goes back to my goal to get more information and find a way that we can support these kids. He says, I feel very strongly that we need to reach out and offer them support. They may not want it, but I think it is our responsibility to reach out and make sure they have that support. And Kaiser said that although he is not entirely sure what this support would entail, it had, he has some ideas, and these are his ideas. This is a quote, perhaps sessions with a psychologist or a behavioral psychologist, or maybe even just touching base with a parent, Kaiser told LifeSite News. We already have psychologists or support people in to make sure that students are comfortable and to make sure that they can express their feelings about a situation. Now, isn't that interesting? Self-identity must have a boundary, is what he's saying. And even he recognizes that. And he recognizes this not as normal. Interesting, isn't it, that he would use those terms? And we have been saying that about this for how many years now? This isn't normal. But when it goes to the extremes that we're looking at today, we need to sit up and take notice because there is something happening and something underfoot which definitely, definitely does need to be addressed. And I believe it needs to be addressed in the church. I think it's important for our young people, those of you who are young teens or younger than that, you need to hear what I have to say today. You see, identity is not something that we decide on entirely. Identity is something that God determines and gives to us. And I know what I'm going to say about this may be a bit controversial, but I know that what I am going to say about this is rational, and it accords with reality, and it accords with the Scriptures. God created man in His image. We're told that very clearly. And he created them male and female. Your identity is basically determined by your biological sex. That is the scriptural teaching. And that is the reality of life. Uh, I have never in my lifetime had much difficulty in determining who was a boy and who was a girl. Now we are told that that is all culturally defined. In fact, it's all intertwined even with white supremacism, which I confuses me. I don't understand how all of these conclusions are drawn. There will be times when identity becomes an issue because we all struggle with our identity when we're growing up. I can remember that. I remember distinctly some of the things I wrestled with when I was an adolescent. And if somebody were to have stood in a classroom and told me that I had a right to determine whether I was a boy or a girl, that would have been immensely, horrendously confusing for me. It would have destabilized my whole life. I don't know how I would have survived something like that. Fortunately, in my era, that wasn't an issue. I know that there are issues that are valid in that area. There are some people who really do struggle with this, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to acknowledge it, and we need to be there to help them. 
and we can't be there to help them as Christians coming down on them like there's some sort of a uh, sinner that's out in left field somewhere that needs mercy and help. That's not the approach we need to take. We need to be compassionate. We need to get information. We need to understand what's, what's happening. We need, to, we need to study the issue. We need to work on getting a grasp on what's happening so that we can be effective in communicating with them. So I'm not talking about some self-righteous attitude this morning that we as God's people need to assume. Not at all. God forbid that that would happen. That would be a disgrace to Christ himself. He would never do a thing like that. This portion in Romans chapter 12, I believe, is dealing with identity. In fact, I believe it is at the heart of Paul's message throughout the entire book of Romans. Paul is seeking to communicate the gospel to these people in Rome. He identifies that gospel clearly when he says that it, in, in, that it involves the righteousness of God which is given to us as a gift through repentance and faith in Christ. And it determines our standing before the Father. And he talks about the reality that we need to understand who we are as Christians and we need to begin to, to identify as those who are redeemed. That's his whole theology in the book of Romans. And he goes through great pains to do that. And when he reaches Romans chapter 12, he talks about the reality of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. The conformity to the world is conformity in the externals. It is embracing the way the world views itself and the way the world views all of humanity. And Paul says there will be a difference when you are one of God's children in this sense that you will not embrace the world's definitions of who we are. We can't do that. He says when we are being transformed, the transformation will be a radical change of mind, which means that we no longer embrace the way the world views us, we now embrace the way God views us. That's what he is saying here. Notice he says in verse 2, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are not commanded to renew our minds. That's not the command here. The command is to be transformed. And the transformation takes place because our minds have been renewed. That's the picture. The command is the transformation. The command is not the, trans is not the renewing of the mind. We've talked about that. When we turn to Christ and we are reborn by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God comes to live within us and He gives us a different way of thinking. That's crystal clear in the Scriptures. We have a capacity when we come to Christ to begin to understand life from God's perspective. It's a total, radical transformation. And in order for us to understand who we are, we need to understand the reality that God defines who we are. That is the change of mind that takes place. That change of mind impacts us in various different ways. The renewed mind is the opposite of the world mindset. We've already looked at that. And the renewed mind will prove what the will of God is in our lives. In other words, it will determine our identity. It will determine why we are who we are and what it is that God would want us to do because of who we are. Notice what he says. He says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may, what? The renewing of the mind, so you may, what? So you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
So what he is saying here is that when God transforms our mind, we begin thinking like he does, the one thing that is going to happen to us is that we are going to embrace his will for us. And that word prove has the idea of testing in order to approve, not to disapprove. We could probably translate it this way. The renewing of your mind so that you might approve what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, why would we seek to approve the will of God? We would do it because we understand three things. The will of God is first of all good, intrinsically good. Secondly, the will of God is well-pleasing. And thirdly, the will of God is perfect. Now, from whose perspective is it good, well-pleasing, and perspective? I believe that's from our perspective. For us, it is good. For us, it is well-pleasing. For us, it is perfect. Do you see what he's saying? This transformation of mind that takes place at our conversion enables us to embrace the will of God as that which is perfect for us. In other words, my identity is defined through my relationship with Christ and I begin to understand what the will of God is for my life because that will is good, acceptable, well-pleasing and perfect. I begin to understand that if I embrace that will, I will find the perfection and the fulfillment and the satisfaction and the purpose and the meaning that God wants me to have for my life. So the will of God or the renewed mind will prove to us or will prove what the will of God is. The world embraces its will. The Christian, the believer, the person who is born again, who is justified by faith according to Romans, that person that person will have an understanding of who he is our identity will become very very clear the next thing we notice here is that this renewed mind that god god gives us this this renewed mind that embraces the will of god this renewed mind pursues the will of God in service. And that's what he talks about in the rest of this portion. In fact, from here all the way to the end of uh, chapter 14, he talks about the issue of service. And the first context of that service is within the body of Christ. He talks about us as being a body. There are many members. And all the members don't have the same function. Uh, but what Paul says is that the renewed mind will pursue the will of God in service in that we will begin to discover the giftedness that God has given to us. And that is directly related to identity. I don't know about you guys, but I've always had an issue uh, when it comes to work. Uh, I have often looked at myself as a carpenter. I wonder why. <laughs> Forty some years as a carpenter. What I do is very, very, very connected to my identity. Absolutely. And so when Paul talks about this idea that God has given each one of us gifts, and that gift is to be used in service, in ministry, he is talking here about the development of identity. If you're a farmer, it's hard for me to think of you apart from the reality that you farm. If you're a mechanic, when I think of Tim, I think, well, Tim and Tim, I think of mechanics, okay. Uh, is that wrong? No, that isn't wrong. I know that that is not my identity, that identity because I am a person, uh, an individual, unique. But the development of my personality, the understanding of who I am, comes through practicing the strengths that God has given to me. And so this idea that the renewed mind pursues the will of God in service 
means that the renewed mind will help me develop a true perspective of who I am. And I am not what I do, but what I do declares a lot about who I am, right? You don't take an electrician when you have a plumbing problem, do you? You wouldn't call an electrician to fix your plumbing, and you wouldn't call a plumber to fix your electrical problem. Why is that? Well, you call a plumber because you need a plumber, you call an electrician because you need an electrician. Now, does that mean that that particular ability they have defines their person? No, it doesn't. But what it does do is it defines the abilities and capacities that you have been given by God. And that's why Paul deals with this whole renewal of the mind, and in dealing with that, he deals with this embracing of the service that God has equipped us to do. So that's what he is doing here. The renewed mind pursues the will of God in service, and it relates to the giftedness in the body of Christ. Now there are a couple of things that I think are important to understand about this. That if we think of ourselves more highly than we ought, that's delusional thinking. It's not according to reality, and it goes beyond the scope of reason. It's not reasonable to think that. I think I've used this illustration on a number of occasions. Uh, a woman, a beautiful woman that is standing in front of a mirror, looks at herself and makes the comment, I'm ugly. Is, is that a statement of reality? Is that a statement of humility? No, it isn't. It's a denial of reality. It's not a true statement. Why do we have so much trouble with this whole thing where if a beautiful woman stands in front of the mirror and says, I'm beautiful, we somehow think that that's gross and immoral. No, it's not. That's just an admission of the truth. Now, if an ugly woman stands in front of the mirror and does that, but then who defines what beauty and and ugliness is. How do you define that? Well, the reality is this, that the renewed mind that God gives us enables us to understand the lane that we're supposed to drive in. It gives us the parameters for our life. When we went on our holiday, I used uh, cruise control a lot. Uh, and I'll have to confess that I was cruising at a pretty high speed sometimes, but anyway, cruise control works beautifully. But then we have a function on this car, and I'm just getting familiar with it, and it's going to take me a while yet, but we have this lane control function on there. And uh, so, you know, we have one function on the lane control, where on the monitor you have dotted green lines, and you see your vehicle in those green lines. If you happen to go over and it senses the, the paint on the line on the side, you feel this little you feel this little rumble on your steering wheel. I thought there was something wrong with the car when I first did that. I didn't know what on earth was going on in it. My wife figured it out before me. So then we went on our holiday and I decided, well, I'm gonna set this this distance thing, you know, so you stay behind the vehicle. Uh, it worked really, really great, uh, except a lot of times it said 110 on my monitor and I looked at the speed and I'm going to 95. Well, what in the world's going on? Well, I can't get any closer to that car ahead of me. He's going 95. So anyway, uh, that was handy. But then the one that was really, really interesting is the one that had the solid green lines. And uh, when I was driving the vehicle, and I don't recommend this, but I'm, I'm testing this now. Is this thing going to really work? So I kind of let go of the steering wheel and see if this thing's going to stay between the lines. And guess what? It does. <laughs> Stays between the lines. Well, it's really tempting, you know, just to go like this. <laughs> but our vehicle has a function on yours probably does too. It warns you right away. Beep, 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 beep. You get this sound, you know. Well, what's going on? Oh, I got to hang on to the steering wheel. Okay. <laughs> but it's called lane control. That's an illustration, I think, of the way God is at work in our lives. He has a lane he wants us to drive in. He wants us to stay in our own lane. Not try to be somebody else. Be the person that God has created you to be. Find out who you are. That's valid. And I admit that. 
But the renewed mind that God gives us enables us to understand the way that we're supposed to be. And that's what it is. That's what he's saying. And he speaks about spiritual giftedness in service within the body of Christ. Your spiritual gift determines the lane that you're going to be able to travel in as a Christian. If you start a veer from that, God will let you know. There will either be a little bit of a rumble on the wheel, or it won't let you go that over that line. That spiritual gift that God has given to you and has given to me must be honored must be recognized and we need to live within those within those parameters well the renewed mind embraces not only my giftedness but the renewed mind embraces yours do you realize that you, when you become a Christian you become a member of the body that means you either become a finger or a fingernail, or a hand, or a foot, or an eye, or a ear. You can't be everything. You can only be one thing. That's the picture. And why is that? Uh, I, I love this body illustration of the church. It's just so rich. And we'll look a little bit more at that next week. But the reason for that is, is this. That if I am the hand, you're my foot. It's called interdependence. We are members one of another, is what he says. If you are the foot, I'm your hand. If I am the eye, and you are the ear, I'm your eye, you're my ear. So completeness, fulfillment, identity is found in the body of Christ when we determine or know what our lane is and we travel in that lane and we acknowledge others who are next to us who can supply something that we don't have. You see, I hope I can preach. I do my best at it. But I am not good in the nursery. <laughs> I'm it's all thumbs. Like I, I, honestly, I am absolutely lost when it comes to anybody under 16 years old. <laughs> I'm not commenting on you, younger generation here, but that's not my comfort zone. I just, I, I have a hard time functioning here. I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to communicate. But give me a 16 year old, and I don't care if they're just a wild yahoo. Uh, I can communicate with a 16 year old. I. I I understand the language. I'm, I'm comfortable in that context and above. <clears throat> and incidentally, I'm starting to get comfortable with those who are 75 and older too. So, <laughs> <laughs> but the <clears throat> the reality is this, people. God saves us. God gives us His Spirit, transforms us inwardly, gives us a new mind. That new mind gives us the capacity to see life from God's perspective. And when we begin to see, God, see life from God's perspective, we begin to understand who we are and where we fit in. Every person is unique. It's really hard sometimes to preach and to teach in front of people because you want so much to be somebody that you're not. One of the hardest things for me to do, in all honesty, is to look at myself later on today doing what I'm doing here right now that's one of the hardest things for me. Why is that? It's hard to admit. Because I'm not happy with who I am. That's it, bottom line. And I've had to do a lot of repenting. COVID has been good for me. Because <laughs> I've had to watch myself. And uh, humbling, well, I don't know humbling. That's a term that's used kind of in many different ways in our day. Yeah, it's, uh, it's humbling. But it's, it's actually been good for me because I've had to accept who I am. I can't do it any differently. This is me. And if God can take and use that, which I am told in His Word, He can. Hey, that's pretty cool. I can just be who I am and God can use that. It's a wonderful release, a wonderful release.
Does that mean we're going to be content with where we're at? No, I think that's a whole other issue we have to think about and deal with because there's growth that's needed. And I don't believe that growth should stop at 78 years old. I think that growth should stop at the grave. I think we should be growing constantly until we leave this life and enter into Christ's presence. Well, what can termites teach us? Termites may be hard to love, but they're easy to admire. Termite moths can reach as high as 30 feet, and based on their tiny size, the that's the equivalent of humans building something twice as tall as the 2,722 foot building in Dubai. And I can't pronounce the name of that building. You see, the interior of a termite mound is an intricate structure of interweaving tunnels and passageways, radiating chambers, galleries, archways, and spiral staircases. And to build the mound, termites move vast quantities of mud and water. And in the course of a year, 11 pounds of termite can move about 364 pounds of dirt and 3,300 and 3,300 pounds of water. The point of all of this construction is not to have a place to dwell. The colony lives in a nest six to seven feet below the mound, but to be able to breathe. Did you realize that? The termite mound is so that the termites will be able to breathe. The mound acts as a lung for the colony, managing the exchange, exchange of gases leveraging small changes in wind speed to inhale and exhale. Termites appear to do all of this without any centralized planning. There are no architects, engineers, no blueprints. The termite mound isn't just a building. It's much more like a body, a self-regulating organic process that always reacts to its changing environment. Scientists claim that the individual termites are not very intelligent. They lack memory and the ability to learn. Sounds a little bit like me. Put a few termites in a petri dish and they wander about aimlessly. But you put enough termites together in the right conditions, guess what? They build you a cathedral. That's us. That's the people of God. Every single one of you are indispensable. And if you do not acknowledge and recognize and honor the giftedness that God has given to you, nobody, nobody can fill that void. Nobody. Because you are extremely unique. And God has designed it that way. Our identity is determined by God not by us. I know we grow, I know we develop, I know we mature, I know all of those things are true, but the bottom line is this, that when we get to a point where we think that we can determine our identity and we can self-identify, you cannot do that and honor God both. You can't. Can't be done. Because God is the one who determines who we are. Father, Take this word from you and use it to encourage each of us in our walk with you. We pray in Christ's name.